This is very much about starting from the perspective of the investor objective, the investment needs that you have. So is this an investment that is earmarked and, and really looking at long-term capital growth, in which case you want a much higher proportion to growth assets, i.e. equities, versus if the main objective of that portfolio is one really to either provide an active income or at least have a lower risk profile because of the support that that income gives into the total return. Have you ever wondered about how we make decisions about our money? Or why we feel the way we do about those decisions? Welcome to Nudging Financial Behavior, the podcast that aims to help you understand how and why you make certain decisions about money. Presented by Dr. Giselle Willows, an expert in behavioral finance. This podcast is all about looking at human behavior and biases, especially when it comes to your finances. You can catch the series on YouTube, the Nudging Financial Behavior blog, or on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to like and subscribe to ensure you don't miss an episode. Special thanks to our sponsor, IG Market South Africa, a world-leading online trading provider that gives you access to opportunities across thousands of financial markets through their intuitive platforms and apps. Let's get started. Here we are at episode nine of season two of the Nudging Financial Behavior podcast. I'm Dr. Giselle Willows. In this series, we're breaking down human behavior and biases as we try to help you understand how and why you make certain decisions about your finances. With this episode, we're continuing our discussion on home bias, looking specifically at how we overcome this bias by ensuring we have proper diversification in our investment portfolios. I'm really excited about my guest today, Narina Fisser from ETFSA is going to help us through this process. You're going to get a lot of practical tips in this episode. But before we head off on our discussion, please make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons, please. Let's take a look at what diversification means. It's actually a risk management strategy for investing. Now you know why I spend so much time talking about risk at the beginning of the season. It keeps on coming up in investing. When you have a diversified portfolio, you have different investments across a range of different asset classes, from various industries to different countries to a variety of financial instruments. The reason this is considered less risky is because you aren't putting all your eggs in one basket and hoping that the market doesn't drop that basket for you. There are basically five different types of asset classes. We have equity, investing in the market, This is usually the engine house of your portfolio as it helps it grow. But we know the market is volatile, so that's why these types of assets are generally suitable for a longer term horizon. Then we have interest bearing assets, things like bonds, preference shares, currency notes. These bring in income for your portfolio. Next, we have real estate or property. This can be the physical asset, so that property you live in that you also own counts, but it can also be investing in listed property funds. As property generally has low correlation to shares, it can bring nice diversity to your investment portfolio. It can also provide a good hedge against inflation. Then we have physical commodities for those that like to invest in precious metals. There's no payoff, no dividends, no interest, but as they have a different payoff profile, they can be a good hedge. Finally, we have cash which can give your portfolio some stability. It gives you liquidity and as it's lower risk, it's also well suited for a shorter term horizon. There are some very clear benefits to diversification. For those of you listening to this podcast, I'm showing our viewers on YouTube a graph. I'll link to it in the show notes so you can see it when you have a moment. So in the shorter term, some asset classes go up, some go down, and that diversification protects your overall portfolio. But over the longer term, we see everything eventually go up. Let's look at this a different way. Here's a pie chart. Yes, I'll link to it for our listeners. This pie chart shows the percentage of time a particular asset class was the best performing asset class between 1930 and 2022. Overall, this chart shows that equities was the best performing asset class since 1930. But cash was the best performer for 10 of those years and listed property for nine years. 
The reality is that asset classes have distinct secular or long-term periods of under or overperformance. Diversification is the only free lunch in investments. Use it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Let's get someone who knows a lot more about diversifying your investment portfolio than me on the line. Narina Fisser is a CFA and was president of the CFA Society in South Africa. She's also passionate about financial education and empowering people. To this end, Narina regularly offers her services as a market commentator. She's also the person who taught me a brilliant way to ensure that my own portfolio is properly diverse. Thank you for joining us, Narina. <laughs> my pleasure, Giselle. Thank you so much for hosting me. I really look forward to our conversation. Okay, so first things first. Why is it important for us to regularly evaluate our portfolio from a diversity perspective? So I think when we think in terms of a general investment portfolio, it is quite likely that you might have in your investment portfolio at least some investments where you as the individual investor would not solely responsible for selecting those investments, especially when we look at things like unit trusts, for example, or ETFs, which are also unit trusts, where the underlying fund might be something that's put together by a professional fund manager. And so you don't necessarily always know exactly what's inside each of those. And if we think of a unit trust or an ETF really as a like a like a hamper, a basket of goodies, think a little bit like, you know, those uh, those lucky packet hampers that we got when we were children, you know, where it looked very shiny and pretty from the outside, but you actually had no idea what you were going to get inside. Whereas if you are, have the ability, and we certainly have that ability with, with very transparent products like ETFs, but if you have the ability to actually open up that hamper, open up that basket of goodies and say, what's actually inside, we will know much better. But because these things change over time, we need to regularly revisit that, go back and say, does this thing still actually hold what I think it holds? Or does it now maybe hold something which I already have in many other places in my portfolio? So some of these investments might be fairly consistent in terms of what they hold as the underlying investments, but others could actually change quite substantially over time. And that's why I think it's a very good and almost like a hygiene, a regular investment portfolio hygiene to go back, revisit, engage what's inside my investment and ensure that you're sufficiently diversified. I've been chatting to the listeners and sharing with them the different asset classes. What I think might be nice for you to unpack is the industry guidelines of how much our investment portfolio should be sitting in each of those asset classes. And then within those asset yeah. classes, we have sub-asset classes. Can you give us any guidance there? Yes, yeah, so certainly, you know, when we think in terms of different asset classes, um, typically we think of these as, as different groups of investments that offer different payoff profiles, if I can put it that way. So we would typically talk about things like growth assets. That's typically your equities or your shares, where the main intention of that investment is really about the capital growth, the price appreciation that you get over time. Other types of assets focus a lot more on the income component. So here, the income could either be interest rates that you receive, could be dividends, for example, but the main focus of that type of investment is about income generation and not necessarily income only for you to earn as an income as an investor and to live off that income, but also because income to a large extent provides almost a bit of a stabilizer in portfolios. When we look at um, total return, it's a combination of capital gain or price appreciation and the yield or the income that you get from that portfolio. And so different asset classes are going to have different proportions of capital gain contributions to total return and then interest or income yield to the total return. So I think from that perspective, when we start and say, when you say things like industry guidelines around this, this is very much about starting from the perspective of the investor objective, the investment needs that you have. So is this an investment that is earmarked and, and really looking at long-term capital growth, in which case you want a much higher proportion to growth assets, i.e. equities, versus if the main objective of that portfolio is one really to either provide an active income or at least have a lower risk profile because of the support that that income gives into the total return. 
So from a broad perspective, when you look at, at, at a CISO um, classifications, I wouldn't even call them guidelines, but classifications. So CISO, the Association for Savings and Investments in South Africa, when we look at multi-asset portfolios, or also known as balanced funds by, by many people um, also in industry, we typically find that a high equity portfolio would have up to 75% of that portfolio just in equities. When you look at the low equity portfolios, we're typically looking at something where the equity exposure could be as low as 40%. And anywhere in between the sort of the extent of the growth um, assets or the equities would indicate higher risk, higher tolerance for variability, but then certainly also focus really on long-term capital growth. Of course, you could have an equity-only portfolio where you literally would have 100% in equities. You could have an income-only portfolio where 100% would be in interest-bearing, either cash or bonds or so on. So I think from that perspective, the 40 to 75% guideline is typically what you're going to find within industry. And interestingly enough, also, when we look at the likes of Regulation 28 of the Pension Funds Act, which is really the one that says, how does the pension fund industry, how are they allowed to invest assets? We do have a limit there in terms of equity exposure in a retirement portfolio, which is also 75%. So that gives you some sort of indication of broadly, depending on your objectives, how you should be thinking about your allocation to different asset classes. And these are guidelines. I mean, we all need to consider these percentages and decide what works for us. And then obviously the Absolutely. listeners must also know that if they need any help with this, they should speak to a financial planner and get some input from them yes. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, we're really talking very broadly here, you know, as if all equities are one single homogenous asset class. But I mean, let's just start, start with the geographic decision, for example. Are we talking about South African equities or are we talking about global equities? When we talk global, is this about developed markets or is it about emerging markets? Is this US only or are we looking at UK, Europe? That's just sort of from a geographical perspective. Add to that things like different industries. You know, are we talking mining companies or financial companies or technology companies or going even another step further and say different types of investment styles? Is this a group of equities that offer high dividends, for example, or exhibit strong momentum or represent good value. You know, these are all different um, ways in which we can look at this broad asset class called equities. And you mentioned it in your introduction, subcomponents, almost sub asset classes within these broad asset classes being equities, bonds or interest bearing, and then maybe property or some others as well. And yes, certainly I think professional assistance or doesn't have to be a professional. You can certainly educate yourself, but understand that if you're going to do this yourself, you probably need to have the time, the capacity, and, and, and the, the appetite to engage with this sufficiently in order to make a well-informed decision. And now, because I have you, and you are the queen of ETFs, <laughs> I need to ask you, what are some of your favorite ETFs for this, or these particular asset classes? So Giselle, I always prefer to start with really the broadest um, type of exposure that would capture the big broad asset class for me. So if I'm going to look at equities, for me, the starting would, would point would be global equities. And remember, South Africa is part of that global. So we have a wonderful ETF listed on the JSE by 10X. It's called the Total World ETFs, and it is exactly what it says it is. Um, the underlying investment, the underlying index gives you investment exposure to approximately 9,000 companies globally. It covers developed markets and emerging markets. It covers large cap, mid cap and small cap shares. So really a single investment that can give you as the investor a one stop shop really to get exposure to most of the prominent and important companies in the world. Similarly, we can do something just within the South African market because maybe your focus in your portfolio is specifically just on South African investments. And in this context, we have the Satrix Capped All Share ETF. That one is, again, as the name say, All Share. So it invests in all of the shares that are listed on the JSE. It is capped. So what that does is it actually just limits 
the exposure that you would have to any one company to 10%. And for me, again, that is a really good single investment that's going to capture the entire South African equity market for me. And similarly, we can then start looking towards um, other asset classes as well. Most of our bond or interest-bearing investments that we have available via ETFs are focused on government bonds. It is by far the biggest component of our market. And we often get people sort of asking about contrasting something like retail savings bonds with a government bond ETF. And I'm not going to go into the details of this now. But when we are talking about bond investments, really a bond ETF is a great way for a retail investor to get exposure to government bonds which normally would require a minimum investment of a million rand to buy just one bond. Retail savings bonds can give you some of that exposure, but it's a lot less flexible than a bond ETF would be. And so I can continue sort of through the different asset classes, the different investment strategies, the different geographical exposures. But, you know, I really think that if if an investor starts with a very simple portfolio of a good chunk of global equities, a reasonable proportion of South African equities, because this is still our home market. So this is where we live and work and will probably need income. And then supported with that some good interest bearing government bonds. And we are quite lucky at the moment, I think globally, that ordinary cash, just money market investments are actually giving us very attractive interest rates. Who knows how long this will last, but certainly the expectation is at the moment, I think, is very much this idea of higher for longer. So we are currently in a sweet spot where interest rates are really giving you a real return. So it gives you a higher interest rate than the inflation rate. And so this is often a very good time where we want to make use of that very low risk opportunity to still get very decent interest to return in our portfolios. Next, I want to talk about a word I heard you say, which is diversification. (laughs) Because it's quite easy to think you're diversified if you have multiple ETFs or investment accounts, right? Yes. But more than that, you also have sometimes some unintended consequences of concentration or duplication. So what should we watch out for here? What are some duplicate ETFs that we should be aware of? Giselle, you're so right. I think often people think that they are diversified if they hold multiple investments, so multiple different ETFs in a portfolio. And I use the term diversification where you think you are diversified, but actually you're not. So let's just quickly think in terms of sort of the construct of the investment world as it stands at the moment. By and large, The developed markets are about 85% of the global investment opportunity set and 15% in emerging markets. The next thing to look at is within developed markets, the US is pretty much two thirds of the developed market. Similarly, in China, we've also seen China a massive representation of emerging markets. So what we often find is that we see people invest in something that he thinks, they, especially I think one of the favorite ones for many people is an MSCI World um, ETF, because the name sounds like it's the world, the whole world, but actually that's just developed markets. So by investing in the MSCI World, you're excluding all emerging markets. And what you don't maybe realize that the, is that two thirds of that investment is already the U.S., So then I see people couple that MSCI world with the likes of an S&P 500. And they think, oh, now I'm I'm diversified. But actually, there's a significant overlap between those two. Add on to that then the other type of thing. And this often comes from from people's um, sort of choice of investments on the basis of past performance. I mean, we've certainly come through a decade or more of exceptionally strong performance from U.S. equity markets. So they look at something like the S&P 500 and how well that's performed, and they look at the NASDAQ and how well that's performed, and they think, oh, let me put in these two U.S. equity exposures. Meanwhile, the overlap between those two are also significant. I think a term that was coined during 2023 was the Magnificent Seven, the seven largest companies that really dominate U.S. equity markets and is now a significant proportion of the S&P 500 
and a significant portion of the NASDAQ 100. So these are some of the unintended consequences that I often see that people end up with in their portfolios. You know, I'm not even going to go to the point where people think that they can buy the same S&P 500 ETF, but from multiple ETF providers and then think that they are diversified. No, as we often say, you might be diversified amongst street addresses in Cape Town, but that's about the extent of the diversification that you have in your portfolio. <laughs> so, listeners, not only is Narina the queen of ETFs, she's also the queen of Excel. So, yes, of course, there is an Excel template that she's developed that you can use to do all we've discussed in this episode. Set your diversification goals, look at how diversified you are currently, and plan how you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to be. I'll include a link in the show notes for you to download. But next, let's discuss what we should do if we look at our portfolio and see that we aren't perhaps as diversified as we'd like to be. Mm -hmm. What should our action plan be? Yeah. So, so Giselle, for me, a very important starting point is first to design almost my ideal. Where would I like to be? What do I want my portfolio to look like, given my investment objectives, given my needs, might be income or whatever the case might be? So have a almost a target diversified portfolio view in mind. Then to go and look at what do I currently have? And that's where that spreadsheet, I think, becomes quite helpful in terms of just doing an aggregation also of the different types of investments that you might have. Because you might have a pension or provident funded work or an RA, or you might have a tax-free investment account, or you might have more than one discretionary investment account. So to aggregate all of those together to get a proper view of what is my current state of play. And then I go to the step of thinking of the London underground and the mind, the gap, now I've got to mind this gap between where I am and where I want to be. And, and the plan then comes in to say, how do I progress from where I am to where I want to be in the most cost efficient and tax efficient way? So those are very important considerations because it's not just about throwing everything out that I've got now, selling out of everything, incurring a lot of costs and possible capital gains tax and all of that just to get to my target. No, it is a process and it's a process of, of, of moving from where you are to where you want to be. A big aspect of that also, the two things that I just want to highlight is that you understand which of these different, let's call them investment pots that you have, these different types of investments, be they retirement savings or tax-free savings or discretionary savings, in which of those do you actually have the ability to make changes? Because as an ordinary pension or provident fund member or even a member of a retirement annuity fund, you don't have the option of choosing the individual underlying investment. So you're a, you're a taker almost there of what that asset allocation looks like. So understand what it is, know what it is, but also know that you can't make changes there. Therefore, any gaps that you identify elsewhere, you now need to go and address that in your discretionary investments or in your tax-free investments. And most likely, it's going to be in your discretionary investments. So understand also that your discretionary investment portfolio on its own might not represent the full target that you've got in terms of what you're looking after, but it might be what is almost called a completion strategy. That's the portfolio that makes up for everything else that you can't do somewhere else. So that's the one aspect that I want to highlight. But I think the second aspect also is that that gives us great guidelines around ongoing contributions. And, and we are very strong um, sort of promoters of regular investment contributions. That that's a great way to build wealth over time. So look at what you are contributing on a regular basis through a monthly debit order, for example, and then allocate that monthly contribution that you're making to the asset class or to the component where you've got the biggest gap, where you've got the biggest shortfall. And so you'll hear that this thinking around how I allocate my new contributions, my new investments, has, has got very little to do with what is the state of the markets? Are we high? Are we low? Did the markets just fall? You know, should the RAND, should I be getting out the country because the RAND is going to hell in a handbasket or whatever? None of those considerations feature in my plan that says, I am addressing my own gaps, my own shortcomings in my portfolio, 
and I'm using this as the opportunity to move myself closer to my target, which I've identified as the most appropriate portfolio allocation for my specific investment needs and objectives. I promised the listeners some practical tips in this episode and you can't get more practical than this. <laughs> but I need to stress that this is all general advice. For specific yeah, advice on yeah. a portfolio, please go and talk to a financial advisor. Thank you so much, Narina. This has been really helpful. I know that I personally have found your templates and webinars over the years to be a great source of information. I'm so pleased to hear that. You know, I really believe that an informed investor is probably the best investor that they could be. And, and I really enjoy when people are prepared to engage with their investments, engage with their money. Remember, none of us are born financial geniuses. We don't know this stuff when we're born. And in fact, we don't learn this at school. We all have to learn this as we go along. So I also just want to encourage your listeners to continue engaging with what you offer, with the financial education that's out there. You know, educate yourself, learn about this, and then apply it to you personally, because that is the most appropriate plan. The most appropriate plan is not what your friend or your mother or your um, boss is doing. The most appropriate plan is something that works for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, I must just mention that diversification isn't going to save you from every eventuality. One thing that the crash of 2008 taught us was that even if you were invested internationally, it didn't make much difference to your returns. Pretty much everything everywhere fell at the same time. But that was definitely a case of extraordinary circumstances. Crises that are localized to specific countries or regions are far more common. When you have an internationally diversified portfolio, your long-term investment outlook will be positive. So, how do we overcome home bias and ensure that our investments are diverse? Let's have a quick recap of everything we discussed in this episode and the previous one. Firstly, education and awareness. That's the first step in recognizing its presence. Educate yourself about the advantages of diversification and the risks associated with an overly concentrated portfolio. Next, use global indices. We've just heard from Narina about exchange traded funds, also known as ETFs, and many track global indices. These funds provide exposure to a wide range of international assets, making diversification easier. You might remember that Terry O'Dean also mentioned this very thing in our discussion back in episode four. I teach personal finance to uh, big classes of undergrads. I'll be teaching 600 students tomorrow. And what I tell them is when they're saving for retirement, they should simply buy and hold low cost mutual funds, generally what we call index funds. Find funds that have very low fees, which is quite possible these days, and just hold them. Of course, regular portfolio rebalancing is vital. Take the time to periodically review and rebalance your portfolio. During these reviews, sell off over-concentrated domestic assets and reinvest in underrepresented foreign ones. Don't go overboard with this though, you don't want to be incurring unnecessary trading costs. Heed these wise words. Having the opportunity to follow the market frequently gives you the opportunity to see if you need to reevaluate your portfolio. But reevaluating your portfolio shouldn't trigger a sell signal so frequently. Personally, I like to do this evaluation of my portfolio in January. Not only is it the start of the year, but we're also two months till the end of the tax year. So it's a great time to assess whether I've maxed out my tax free savings, what my retirement annuity contributions are looking like what new opportunities have come up and set up a plan for the year ahead. Of course, you don't have to do it in January. If you haven't evaluated your portfolio in a while, now is a very good time to do it. And please, always consider seeking professional guidance in the form of a financial advisor who specializes in international investments. They can provide insights into global markets and help tailor a diversified strategy to suit your needs. Finally, with all that in mind, you need to set diversification goals for yourself. How do you do this? First, consider the industry guidelines that are available for anyone to use. Next, take some of Narina's advice and assess for yourself. Look at your current circumstances, where you want your money to be and what you want to be exposed to. 
then go grab the fact sheets or similar for each of your investments, the market value of any property, and do some maths. A pie chart is a great way to visualize this. Finally, compare where you are now to where you want to be. Make some notes for yourself. Focus on the low hanging fruit. For now, it might just be that you have too much sitting in cash. That's an easy fix. Or maybe it's that you don't have enough in emerging markets. Well, now you know where you want to put that extra cash. In the realm of investing, it's crucial to remember Warren Buffett's wise words. Diversification is a protection against ignorance. It makes very little sense for those who know what they're doing. So that's it for our discussion on home buys and the importance of spotting it in your behavior, especially your investing behavior. It's quite a big one to get right if you want to get the most out of your portfolio. It's also quite a tricky one to work against. And if it makes you feel any better, even fund managers display home bias. I'll link to that study in the notes if you want to know more about it. You know what's coming in the final episode of season two, right? We're going to hear from all our guests again as they share some bad financial decisions that they've made. We're all human. And they'll also help me recap everything we've learned in the season. See you there. Oh, and don't forget, if you like this episode, come on, you know what to do by now. Click the like button. That was Nudging Financial Behavior, hosted by behavioral finance expert, Dr. Giselle Willows. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. You can catch the Nudging Financial Behavior podcast on YouTube, our blog, or your favorite podcast streaming platform. Thank you again to our sponsors, IG Market South Africa, for helping to bring the show to life. And now for the disclaimer. This podcast should not be seen as advice. All the information and opinions are the general nature. They are not intended to address the needs or circumstances of any individual. We are not financial advisors, neither are any of our staff or service providers, nor is our sponsor. All expressions of opinion by the host or guest are subject to change without notice in reaction to shifting market conditions. Any information you get from us should be seen as only that, information only.